Welcome to episode 99 of uh, Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. I am joined by my co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, it's Nathan Perez. How's it going? Waalaikum salam. Good to have you back, Omar. Um, have you been? Doing good. And, and by back, I, I, uh, I think you mean back you in are. California in the Bay Area, right? Yeah, I want to kind of situate us a little bit as well. We are recording uh, during this kind of record-breaking heat wave. Uh, I think you and I in Fremont, we hit, we touched about 104, 106 today. So uh, it's been really, really hot. We hope it's kind of the last heat wave that we have. Uh, uh, for those who listen who are outside of California, we actually have these things. And uh, we actually have this phenomenon in California, kind of what commonly known as the Indian summer. Uh, because it is so our summers last kind of late, so we go all the way into September, October. But uh, yeah, hopefully this is it, man. I don't know about you, but I, I would really like to see kind of fall weather again. <laughs> this is kind of crazy, right? It's like, what else do we need this year? Um, I, I was, I was, I was at, as you know, I was out uh, out of California for the past couple months, and I flew back just a few days ago, and I could literally see the fires from the plane. Um, they've drifted. They now they're over about a hundred miles east of here. But you see this black funnel. Uh, from way up high, you don't see the red, orange, and red flames. But you see this funnel that looks like it's not moving. But it's actually a fire, uh, you know, a fire that's happening. So that was happening about 100 miles east of here. Uh, luckily, on the ground, the, the air is clear. But, man, it's like, it's hot. It is hot. Right, right. Uh, and uh, I know it's going to be like that for another couple of days. Um, but, um uh, yeah, I mean, a couple of things I wanted to quickly mention, uh, for, and, and in no particular order. Uh, one was uh, kind of a special shout out, uh, and, and I don't normally sort of do a shout out for, uh, of, of names, but I, I feel it relevant because um, as, as our listeners know, um, Zucky and I, I mean, back when Zucky was the co-host, uh, Zucky and I were invited to Michigan to host a series of kind of live episodes. And uh, uh, one of the folks that had kind of helped put together an event at the University of Michigan uh, was uh, Ria Basha and Muhammad, her fiance at the time, and now they got married uh, over the weekend. And and not only just to give a shout out to kind of folks who have been listeners and supporters of the show, but what I, what was fascinating also about it was I, I kind of a, I attended my first official Zoom wedding, which was kind of <laughs> a surreal experience. Yeah, it was. Kind of a surreal experience. So the wedding was happening in Michigan, and uh, um, you know it was a beautiful wedding. I mean, uh, people were socially distanced and so on and so forth, and it was kind of done outdoors. Um, and the rest of the family, the rest of the Khandan, the tribe, we were all sort of logged in via Zoom. Uh, so kind of a surreal time. And and interestingly enough, that same day, uh, literally like an hour later, we had I, I had to hop on another Zoom invite uh, for. Uh, a friend's daughter's wedding. And so for me, this is kind of a real, again, new milestone in my life because, uh, Omar, you know Wasim, Wasim Ahmed, mm -hmm. right? Wasim oh, yeah, is yeah. one of my closest childhood buddies. And uh, and Omar's met him a number of times when Omar used to come visit uh, Houston. Um, mm -hmm. And Wasim's daughter, dude, Wasim mm -hmm. has a daughter who is 22, I think, 21, wow. 22. But got married over the weekend, man. Mashallah. Oh, nice. so, yeah, Sabarine. So um, another pair of newlyweds. And so, but for me, right, you've got this like childhood friend. His daughter is old enough to get married. And so I, I found that to be kind of a real milestone in terms of like, okay, you know, another checkbox in terms yeah, of. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, I remember back in the day playing, yeah. uh, playing hoops in, in, in Houston and that's right. you know, all that. But that's, yeah, I mean, the Zoom wedding thing seems to be kind of a new phenomenon. You wonder if if some of the dads who are writing those checks for those fancy Chicago weddings and whatnot are just going to be like, this is it from now and we're just doing zoom weddings from now. On, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's a sign of the times and, and I think people are kind of, people re are realizing more now than they were back in, uh, let's say April that this is indefinite. And rather than keep delaying and postponing, you know, important family events, we got to just make the, you know, we got to make the most of it. We got to make the most of the quote unquote new normal. And, you know, uh, I think that's more, what more and more people are doing. Um, anyway, last thing I want to mention, Omar, is uh, we got a tremendous amount of feedback uh, on our last show, and this leads directly to uh, us introducing uh, the guest for today's show, which is that uh, the episode with David Coolidge, uh, we got a phenomenal, uh, uh, not only a quantity of response, but just the response was so uh, overwhelmingly positive, I mean, entirely positive in the sense that 
people found it to be such an intimate and um, just a real intimate conversation with someone who had been on this journey, not only to Islam, but also within Islam. So um, people really responded uh, very, you know, very favorably and uh, we're just really blown away by the episode and, and, and we're kind enough to reach out to us and write to us. So thank you as always for engaging us, listening to us. Um, but for those who've listened to that episode, you can kind of, you can probably go back and listen to a moment where I came to the realization that we aren't going to be able to do justice to the kind of the, the amount of information I think, or the amount of the amount of issues that we wanted to cover uh, because David had taken us on this beautiful journey through his sort of life and his, his, his journey into, and as I said, within Islam, that it would be, you know, n we wouldn't be able to accomplish nor like fully appreciate his journey. And while at the same time, we wouldn't be able to really appreciate the nuances of the Shia tradition had we tried to kind of do it all in one episode. Right. And so I think it was really like towards the middle of that episode, I was like, you know what, we're going to have to kind of go with this really beautiful and intimate journey and conversation with David. And we'll, ha and we'll have to come back and revisit kind of a broader or a deeper dive into Shiism. Uh, I don't know, Omar, if you kind of felt the same way. Yeah, no, I'm just going to add that, uh, you know, great to have all the, all that feedback, but we're, what really made it a uh, powerful episode was David's just willingness to be vulnerable and transparent and, and open. So really, Shout out to him uh, for, for, for joining us last week. And, yeah. and yeah, absolutely. In terms of, in terms of uh, you know, keeping the focus on his personal journey and then having a separate show today, inshallah, uh, focusing on, on, on uh, more topical, I'm definitely interested in learning more. I mean, I, I really, as I was saying on the last show, um, grew up in a small town with very few Muslims and overwhelming number were, were Sunni. Um, so, you know, probably maybe less exposure to Shia, Shia um, uh, friends and, and uh, brothers and sisters. Although there are some close family friends of ours uh, in the fa you know that that are Shia, but just in terms of my knowledge, it's it's definitely uh, a lot of room to, to to learn, and that's why I'm really happy to have Imam uh, Sayyid Hadi Khazwani here today. I hope I said that right. No, yeah. So uh, Imam Hadi Kazwini, um, Omar, I think you were going to tell us a little bit about uh, Imam Hadi Kazwini. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, um, Imam Sayyid Haz Hadi Kazwini is an educator, public speaker, and lecturer in Islamic studies. He's a graduate of the Shi Islamic Seminary of Qum and is currently pursuing his PhD in religion and Islamic studies at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. He has also uh, done a master's from the Bayan Grad School. And he's also on the board of that uh, organization. Uh, so real, real pleasure, uh, honor to have him here. His, his areas of interest, uh, academic interest and research include Islamic intellectual history with a focus on theology, law and Imami Shiism. So welcome, uh, welcome Imam Hadi. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and a uh, uh, final shout out, I, I, I hope or I promise, is uh, I, I want to give a shout out to Jihad Turk, uh, who Jihad is, of course, uh, one of the is the founder of the Bayan uh, Graduate School. Uh, I think the uh, ex uh, I don't know if it's the uh, what his official title is their president, I believe. Um, but uh, yeah, Jihad is, of course, a former guest on the show. We had a wonderful conversation with him, um, in fact, in person right here in the Bay Area when we used to not have to socially distance. Um, but uh, yeah, th thank you, Jihad, for making this happen. And uh, I want to just kind of, yeah, just kind of echo everything Omar said, um, Imam Hadi, which is that we are really excited to have you on the show. And what I hope to be really kind of an informative conversation about Shiism, um, I, I know that based on the conversations you, you and I had offline, you also listened to the David episode. So you kind of know some of the contours of what we did or what we were able to cover. Um, but as we often like to do, I mean, if you don't mind, uh, for someone like myself who spent three years in Michigan, the Kozwini name is no, is, is, is not new. Uh, but for maybe perhaps some of our listeners, if you could maybe give us a little bit about a little bit of your own background and, and certainly a background into the, um, the, uh, mashallah, the Kozwini, uh, clan, uh, from Iran. So that would be really important. Thank you. Yeah, again, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to join you both, uh, Pariz and uh, Omar. 
Um, so uh, I'll start off a little bit about myself and I'll try to be as brief as possible uh, so that we can give sort of maximum attention to the topic uh, uh, of discussion. So I'll start with my, my name. My full name is Sayyid Hadi Ghazwini. Uh, Sayyid is uh, it's an honorific title um, in 12 Rishiism, and we'll come to kind of the various uh, 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 distinctions of groups within uh, Shiism. Uh, so it's an honorific title known in 12 or Shi'i circles, and it basically indicates uh, descent from the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Uh, and so actually we have a family tree where we trace our descent uh, from, I trace my descent all the way 43 generations back to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Um, and, uh, you know, my paternal family uh, you know, traces its lineage back to the Prophet through the seventh Imam, the seventh of the twelve uh, Imams, uh, Musa al-Kadim, who um, uh, died in uh, 183 after Hijrah and is buried in a suburb of Baghdad known as al-Kadimiyah. Um, and sort of, I come from a long line of uh, religious scholars, ulama, and preachers, khutaba, uh, who in recent um, centuries actually resided in and are from Iraq. Um, and in particular, uh, in the city of Karbala, uh, which um, we know is significant uh, because it is the site of uh, sort of the, the Battle of Ashura and the massacre of Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, and his family members and companions on the day of Ashura in the month of Muharram, which, were, uh, which we commemorated about a week ago. Um, and so the family, my paternal family is from, from Karbala. Um, and, you know, my paternal grandparents, uh, and family actually fled Iraq to Kuwait back in 1971. This was when the Baptist regime had just taken uh, hold. Um, and so they had to flee. My grandfather was um, an outspoken critic of um, the Baath regime and of communism. And so he had to flee for his life. Uh, and this happened overnight. Um, otherwise, he would have been imprisoned and executed. In fact, uh, about 15 members of the family were uh, imprisoned and executed, um, including uh, my great-grandfather, who was taken in the middle of the night at the age of 80. Uh, he was taken to prison, um, and he remained there, and he ended up dying in prison, um, in Abu Ghraib prison. Um, and many families in Iraq, many of the Shia families, especially in the South, you know, this is a, a common story. Um, and so, uh, you know, my paternal grandparents and family, they fled Iraq. They went to Kuwait in 1971. They remained there for some time. And then in 1980, they went to Iran. Um, and uh, that's where my parents got married. My mother is also from Iraq, but uh, the family fled Iraq and went to Iran. Um, and that's where my parents um, got married. And I was born in Iran, in Mashhad, which is in northeast Iran in the Khorasan region in 1985. Uh, and then we briefly lived in Syria and London before um, uh, immigrating to the United States in 1994 to actually join my grandfather who came to the U.S. in the mid-80s. Um, and so uh, we, we came to Los Angeles in 1994. I was nine years old at the time. And, uh, you know, we grew up in, in L.A. And we were active in the community. When my grandfather came in the 80s, uh, he and my uncles, several of my uncles, uh, they started to establish Islamic centers and mosques, you know, in the region, in Southern California and other parts of the country. Um, and so we were sort of uh, very active in the community. Uh, my own father, uh, you know, Sayyid Mustafa, um, founded the Islamic Educational Center of Orange County in 1996, which is in Costa Mesa, still there, uh, very active. Um, and so I grew up, you know, in, in L.A., um, like the rest of, uh, of the kids uh, in, in Los Angeles, I learned to skateboard. I broke my arm twice doing that and, and rollerblading, um, you know, enjoying um, uh, the weather uh, and, and sort of, uh, uh, you know, Southern California and everything and, and uh, that's here. Um, you know, I, I call this the real California. I don't know about the Bay Area. Northern California to me <laughs> is not, not real California. This is real California. I, you know. I apologize if I offend you, but <laughs> it is. What it's it definitely is. another an, a different animal. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for so, sure. yeah, and I think like, for most people yeah. who imagine California, uh, who aren't from California or haven't visited, what they imagine is certainly Southern California. Because I know when I first visited the Bay Area, I was like, "This is California. It's actually kind of cold and." It's super green, and what what about all the warm beaches and the surfing, right? Because that, that was the, that, yeah, that was the picture. And then 
then when I visited LA in Orange County, I was like, ah, this is California. <laughs> yeah. And I say that as someone who loves the Bay Area and I wouldn't go anywhere else. So anyway, take that for what it's worth. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, no. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, <laughs> always, always good to plug in Southern California. Yeah, that's um, great. And so, uh, you know, I went to school here. My, my grandfather actually had founded a, a full-time Islamic school, K-12. to And so, you know, we started off in, in public school, but then in, in middle school, we, we started attending this full-time Islamic school. And I graduated in uh, 2002. So I started my senior year in high school in September 2001. And we had, you know, September 11th, uh, this, this major tragic watershed moment for, for all of us as, as American Muslims and Muslims across the globe. And, um, and I remember, um, you know, very vividly that, uh, you know, uh, we, it was like the first week of school or maybe second week of school. And, you know, the administration called us and they're like, you know, no one comes to school. Everyone has to stay at home. Um, you know, we have to figure things out. And, and we started, the school actually started to, to receive like lots of threats, bomb threats, death threats, you know, and so we were, we were really scared. Um, after a few days, things kind of settled down. I remember going back to school and there was like police presence there and, and, and some of our neighbors, uh, you know, um, I had just started driving at the time. And so I, I would drive to school and I remember, you know, pulling into the, the, the school lot. This was in Pomona. The school is in Pomona. And, um, and I remember as we're pulling in, there were some people standing by the gates of the school, just like regular people. And, you know, I was kind of nervous, like, who are these people standing by the gate? But as we approached, they started to wave to us. Um, and it, uh, it, it, it appeared to be they were the neighbors, you know, um, the, those who resided around the school and they had come to show us support and everything. And so, so yeah, I mean, I graduated high school. Then I started um, uh, a college at UC Irvine um, uh, in uh, 2002. And then in 2004, I decided that I wanted to uh, move to Qom in Iran uh, to continue my religious education. I had started under the tutelage of my grandfather, my, my father, me and my cousins. We were a bunch of uh, young men, boys. We kind of, we, we were like enough to, to, to um, put together an entire soccer team. And that, you know, that was our favorite sport growing up as well. And so we kind of decided um, together that we want to go and we want to continue in the family tradition of scholarship, but also, you know, in this post 9-11 world, we kind of want to figure things out, like what's going on. This is not the religion that we grew up with, right? And so we, we wanted to figure out what was going on. And so in 2004, I left um, uh, and I went to Qom and I, uh, and I started to study there intensively. And I stayed there for about six years until 2010. Well, yeah, I take it as... Uh... Is your father also a graduate from the seminary in Qom? Yes, in Qom and um, in Syria. He That's where okay. he studied, yeah. And then was there any, um, like within the family, was it was it sort of expected that you would do that? I mean, you don't seem to indicate that there was kind of this expectation for you to follow the family uh, tradition. Yeah, I mean, I think there's always an expectation with Muslim parents for you to kind of do the thing that your parents are doing uh, and other family members. Um, and yeah. so there is that kind of implicit expectation. But, um, you know, I, I was never kind of, um, it wasn't explicitly expected that we would do this. I mean, I had, I had wanted to go to law school, you know. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I didn't end up going to law school. I did Islamic law, different kind of law. Um, but, but, um, you know, it wasn't expected, uh, explicitly. It's not like, you know, we're, we're kind of forced or anything like that, but of course we were definitely encouraged. Um, and so, um, you know, so that, that was very helpful. And I went there and I, uh, you know, I, I was blessed to have, uh, to work very closely with several, uh, private tutors and scholars in Qom. And Qom is, for those who are not familiar, Qom is kind of like Thank you. the, the, the Azhar of the, the Shi'i, uh, world. Um, and so, you know, there's Qom and then there's also another center of learning, which is Najaf in Iraq. Um, you know, again, this is in 2004. So this is right after the fall of the Ba'ath regime. Um, situation in Iraq was not good. So, so th that's really one reason why I decided to go to, to Qom. And so, um, I stayed there until 2010, you know, intensive training in theology, uh, law, uh, you know, philosophy, logic, Arabic grammar, Quran, Hadith, all of those traditional sort of uh, uh, studies. Um, and often I would go back and forth uh, while I was in Qom 
I would come back and forth to the U.S. and I'd, I'd be speaking at different um, centers, uh, invited to give presentations and lectures and so on and so forth. Um, I got married also when I was in Guam and uh, my wife and I had our first child, our, our son. And then in 2010, I decided I wanted to return back to the U.S. So I came back and I became active in the community, um, you know, as an imam, uh, in leadership capacity. Um, and, and then I decided that, you know, it was very fulfilling for me. It was very rewarding. And so I decided that I wanted to continue in that. But I felt like there were so many things that I, I had to learn. You know, an, an imam does like a million things or is expected to do a million things from, you know, leading the prayers to the khutbah to counseling, you know, marriage counseling, youth counseling, to giving people advice, you know, dietary advice <laughs> and fitness advice and everything and legal advice even sometimes. And so, um, you know, I felt like Qom kind of prepared me as a scholar, but not necessarily as a leader, especially in the American context. And so um, it was at that time where um, I decided that I would join Bayan, uh, Claremont, uh, which had just started uh, as the first Islamic graduate school. And so I joined there. I did my master's there. Um, and then I, uh, I imagine you were yeah. familiar with Jihad because Jihad was yeah. also an imam in the Southern California community, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, so I, I did not know him um, before I came back from Palm. So, but I remember very vividly that it was soon after, it might have been either in 2010 or 2011, where um, we were invited to an interfaith event in LA. And so Jihad was there and he, he approached me, you know, and I was, you know, I, I was kind of representing the Islamic Educational Center and I was in my full garb, you know, my turban and my clerical garb. And so Jihad approached me and he, he introduced himself and we talked a little bit. And then, you know, after that, I uh, I decided that, uh, you know, I, I pursued the, the degree at Bayan. Um, and since then, you know, I've gotten to know him very, very well. Jihad is an amazing person. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, after I finished there. I think uh, someone who also studied in Iran, right? Correct? If, if, yeah, yeah. I believe he, I believe he spelt, uh, spent some time in Iran. I think he was studying Persian there. Uh, and he speaks Persian pretty well, too. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I finished you know, when I finished my master's there, then I, it was actually when I was there that I became exposed to um, Islamic studies scholarship. Um, you know, I was taking courses in Islamic theology, Islamic law, and so I was exposed to Western academic studies. Before that, it was just kind of like, oh, I know there's something called Orientalist studies out there. Uh, they do their own thing. We kind of do our own thing and we do it right because it's, it's, you know, we do it from the traditional point of view and so on and so forth. But I really came to appreciate like this whole new world uh, I was exposed to. And I kind of started to think like, I want to do this. I want to, I want to get into this. And so after I finished, I decided to pursue a PhD. Um, and I was very blessed to be admitted um, to USC um, in the PhD program in religion, Islamic studies. And I worked uh, very closely with uh, Professor Sherman Jackson, uh, who I know you, uh, Purvis, also, uh, you know, studied with and, and many others, our listeners, uh, are, are familiar, of course, with Professor Jackson. Uh, and so that's, that's where I am. I'm, I'm just starting my sixth year right now in the PhD program, hopefully my sixth and final year um, there. Yeah. Thanks for the background. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. So a, and a PhD is, is a, certainly, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a commitment. I mean, uh, you know, six years, you're saying, if you finish in six, consider yourself lucky, inshallah. So. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we'll see how right. it goes. But I've, yeah. been, I've been in school all my life, so I'm I'm, I'm ready to to be done. <laughs> and and um, is your goal when you finish to go into uh, like uh, being an imam, full time imam, or more on the academia side? Um, I think I'd like to do both. I don't know how realistic that is, um, uh, but I'm very interested in in you know academia and in um, sort of uh, going uh, that route. So if I can do both, that that would be great. Nur on ala nur, as they say. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I, I did have a question, but maybe we'll try to come back to this later if we have time, because like you said, I don't want to take away from, um, you know, uh, some of the some of the topics that I really wanted to cover with you. Um, just, just from a high level, I want to I want to say to our listeners, um, you know, for those that may not be familiar so much with the Muslim world in general or are Muslims, but aren't really kind of familiar with 
<clears throat> the kind of uh, uh, like the denominational differences or you know demographics uh, of the Muslim world, um, you know, vast majority of Muslims uh, the world you know world over, I want to say maybe upward of, uh, upwards of eighty plus percent are Sunni or people who identify themselves as Sunni. Um, and roughly about 20% of the world uh, identifies themselves as Shia, um, Shia being plural, Shi'i being singular. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, majoritarian uh, or, or countries where you have a majority presence of Shias, uh, or, or sh that would be certainly Iran, although Iraq, uh, as uh, you know, Imam Hadi has talked about his own family, Iraq is uh, almost about little over 50% or probably right around 50% uh, Shia. Um, and for uh, not only the Ba'athist regime, but even the even some of the rule before that uh, have been ruled by a Sunni minority, although the country is either 50% or more, right, Shia? Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, you also have, in terms of diasporic, uh, you also have obviously large communities uh, in places like Azerbaijan, in India, in the subcontinent, um, and then obviously a big, uh, 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 you know, a, a sizable community here in America. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, your family, or I think I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, but Dearborn obviously has a huge uh, Shia community. Uh, in fact, the Islamic Center of America, which I believe is still the largest mosque in the United States, if not North America, uh, in, in, in your uncle, Imam Hassan Qazwini, is the imam there. So, for those who may or may not be familiar with the Islamic Center of America in Dearborn. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of high level stuff. And last point I want to make is, uh, yes, certainly myself and Omar identify ourselves as Sunni. And Imam Hadi, of course, is a scholar uh, of Islam and a scholar of the Shi'i tradition in particular. This is not going to be a dial. This isn't going to be a debate. This isn't going to be a, uh, you know, uh, sort of look at, issues of confluence and contradiction between the Shia and Sunni tradition. This is really kind of an opportunity for me and Omar, as well as our listeners, to learn uh, about the Shi'i tradition from the perspective and the expertise of a Shi'i scholar. And this is why I particularly, and, and, and I know, again, I speak for Omar as well, why we're so excited to have this conversation. So this isn't going to be, like I said, a debate or a, you know, a intra-faith conversation. This is going to be us trying to learn and benefit from the presence of uh, Imam Hadi on the show. Um, in terms of starting off, I, I know Imam Hadi, when you and I spoke off mic, um, we kind of identified probably three main areas that we wanted to focus on. And God willing, you know, if we uh, were already at about the half an hour mark, but I don't want to, I mean, we're not pressed for time and we want to kind of, you know, we, we want to take as much time as needed, but we want to kind of delve into kind of three main focal areas um, and, and, and feel free to interject anytime. Um, one was going to be history. Uh, two was going to be, say, theology. Uh, and number three was going to be doctrinal or, uh, pra you know, in terms of practice, community practice. Um, is that still kind of the direction or the general kind of parameters of what we of what you think we want to cover, Imam Hadi? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great. And uh, first of all, I appreciate your your earlier comments about this not being sort of a debate. Um, we do want to learn. Um, I'm not here, you know, to try to convert anyone or to try to uh, you know teach uh, uh, or or sort of attempt to to weaken someone's faith or tell them who, who's right and who's wrong that's that's not my objective here at all in the second none point of us, I would, yeah. yeah none of us here are proselytizing our own ideologies so i want to make sure that our listeners know that i'm sorry i did not mean to cut you off no no of course absolutely i, I appreciate that comment and then the other point that i would uh, uh i do like uh, you know sort of that uh, uh, way that we're going to approach it, those kind of three general areas. The other point that I would just make just before I start, um, you know, uh, to talk about these issues is, uh, you know, re religion is a very sensitive topic. Uh, you know, I always tell my students this. Whenever, you know, we talk about religion, it's very, very sensitive. Um, sometimes it touch touches people's core in the most sort of deepest uh, way, their deepest sensibilities. And so I would just remind myself and, and the listeners to kind of be patient um, sometimes, you know, some of the conversations that we have, 
sometimes they're very uncomfortable. Um, but it's only when we have some uncomfortable conversations that we can sort of move forward and, 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 uh, begin to appreciate, uh, uh, one another. Um, so, so, so do we want to start with, um, well, know, I, about history or? Absolutely. And, and I'll start us off. Um, but I, and one last point I want to make, and, and I think, and I appreciate your words as well. Um, but what I said at the outset, and I think uh, echoing or, you know, what Imam Hadi just said, which is that, I mean, that's a sort of a point of, uh, that is that's sort of an introductory comment I make whenever I'm sitting in a interfaith uh, kind of a setting where if I'm speaking on behalf of the Muslim community at large and I'm speaking to an audience of people who may be Christian or Jew, Jew, Jewish or other backgrounds. One of the points I always like to make is that let's be careful or let's allow a space in which we allow individuals to identify or speak on their own behalf and uh, define themselves in their own way, as opposed to imposing definitions or parameters or asking others to define themselves in distinction to what, uh, how we define, you know what I mean, like us. So, for example, I'm not inviting Imam Hadi on the show to define Shiism or himself uh, as a Shi in contradistinction to my uh, sort of Sunni perspective. So we need to allow people the space to identify themselves based on their own parameters and their own sort of, um, you know, ideological frame. And I say that, like I said, when I've been in interfaith conversations and in intrafaith conversations as well. So just want to say that last point. Thank you, Pervius. That's that's great. Yeah. I appreciate those comments. Um, to, to start us off, then, with regards to history, um, would it be safe to say that in terms of the uh, uh, early kind of sectarian difference that emerges in Islam, um, if we put aside the sort of Khadiji, sort of the, the Kharijites, um, the one of the sort of earliest kind of sectarian, uh, 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 I guess I don't want to say divisions, but it is what it is. I mean, one of the early, early sectarianism we see within Islam is this sort of uh, political uh, difference that occurs with regards to the temporal leadership of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, once he passes. Like, what happens to that temporal political authority after the Prophet's death? Okay, great. Uh, that's a great question. So before I immediately start answering that question, um, you know, in the time that we have, it's going to be impossible for us, obviously, to go over to compress, you know, 1400 years of Shiism in, 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 you know, in an hour. And so the, the focus really when we're talking about history, the focus is really going to be on the first about the first four uh, centuries of the Islamic um, sort of Islamic history. Um, Thank you. So, so before before sort of I come to directly to your question, a note about a sort of history. Um, um, I would say that, you know, most or many, many Sunnis um, sort of recognize one main version of history, um, one version of Islamic history. And, and although not everyone, but I think many would probably have a positive view of the early history, the early history of Islam, one that sometimes is uh, romanticized. Um, and, and whereas when we come to many or some or most uh, Shi'is, they kind of recognize two versions of Islamic history. Right. Um, uh, there's the one that many, they sort of uh, uh, understand that many of uh, Sunni Muslims understand and recognize, and then there's a totally different version of history um, that in some ways it corresponds, they correspond those two versions, in some ways they're very, very different. Um, and so the question that we have to ask ourselves is when we talk about Islamic history, whose history are we talking about? Um, whose point of view? Um, you know, Alzheimer McIntyre has this great book um, you know, who's justice, which rationality, right? And we, we kind of have, we have to ask this, this, a similar kind of question about, um, you know, history. Who is writing the history? Who is telling the history? Um, 
what is being told, what is not being told, how are things being told? These are always important questions that we have to ask when we approach history. Uh, Parvez, I know you have, uh, you know, a background in Islamic studies. I think you did a master's, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And so, you know, you, you, you probably see this uh, clearly. Like when we go and we ask ourselves as, as historians of Islam, how do I know what happened during the time of the Prophet, after the time of the Prophet immediately? What are the sources of that historical information? There's probably several sources that you'll point to, prom prominent sources that you'll point to, um, many of which were in the you know second, third, fourth the centuries after Islam. Those were developed in those uh, in those periods, and they were developed. Um, the sources, the standard sources, they were developed by um, individuals who had certain theological uh, uh, sort of um, commitments, certain political commitments, th yeah. certain legal commitments in a uh, certain political context, uh, whether during the Umayyads or the Abbasids. And so that, I think that's a super important question that we have to start with. Whose history or whose version of history, whose story are we uh, listening to? And when we talk about history, there's this whole idea of narrative and counter narrative, right? And so sometimes, um, you know, it, the, the, you'll find within this Shi'i tradition, uh, an acknowledgement of the same events that are acknowledged in the Sunni tradition but they are interpreted in very different ways. The Sunnis see the same exact event in one way, Sh the Shia, uh, you know, view it in a, in a totally different way uh, sometimes. Um, and, and, and we see this, you know, in, in, in like US history, right? We all went through the sort of uh, American educational system. Uh, we're taught about US history. Um, you know, as young children, as we go through that system, there are certain things that we are taught there's a narrative, a kind of version of U.S. history that we're taught. And there are some things that we're not told. They're left out. They are omitted. And it's only, you know, those of us who are lucky enough when we kind of grow up and we figure things out on our own, we might go and read about and, and realize, hey, this is not the version of history that I was taught in school. You know, there are all these like, other things that, you know, that It's that like happened. someone reading, yeah, I, I think of like the the. the, the you know, the example that comes to mind is like being first introduced to Howard Zinn's, you know, people's history of the United States. You're like, whoa, you know, this is history that, yeah, definitely doesn't make its way into the sixth grade uh, uh, civics class. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and so, so, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's the point that I, I think we need to keep in mind. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I really appreciate that. No, no, I, I think that that is, that is really, really important. And so, and you and I haven't talked about this, so I'm going to just throw this out there and you, then you tell me how, what you think. Um, so then I agree. So then where do you begin, right? And where do you begin and what would then be the parameters of talking about history? Um, I would propose, and this is just, again, based on my reading, if you will, of history. Uh, uh, I hope not from a purely Sunni perspective. So I, I would suggest then that we focus maybe on three historical events, uh, well, three or four, and kind of discuss those with regards to the Sunni and Shi'i perspective. Excellent. Very oh, good. no, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. Not according to the Sunni and Shi'i perspective, but rather, see, uh, or from the Shi'i perspective, but events in historical, uh, uh, historical events that are recognized by as being, uh, you know, as, as having occurred according to both Shi and Sunni sources. Great, excellent, okay. very, so, very good, that's right. excellent. So, so prior to the death of the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, in fact, according to most historical records, right around the time the prophet performs his um, uh, Hajjat al-Wida, the, the, the farewell pilgrimage, right? Um, right around that time, there is the very, very important event known as Ghadir uh, Khum, okay? The event that takes place around the well of Khum, uh, or this watering place near Medina, I believe, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So that I would suggest that be one uh, particular event we focus on. Number two, we focus on what transpires right at the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, and then number three, uh, we can talk about uh, Fadak if you want, or we can kind of maybe use that. We can 
to, you know, wrap that within the conversation around the events of the prophet's death, although it takes place shortly thereafter. And then, uh, and then we can talk about Karbala because I don't think we can have a conversation without uh, talking about history or we can't have a conversation on history without talking about Karbala. So um, do you think that those three or four kind of events are the important ones to focus on? Yeah. So I, before I start with, I'm going to add one more event. And please, before no, I please. start with, before I start with Ghadir, I'm going to take a little step back and kind of start a little bit earlier with sort of the birth of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Um, because we know, you know, I mean, your readers will, uh, your listeners, I'm sorry, will recall from uh, the previous episode with, with David Coolidge, you know, there was a discussion about the, the central place of Ali ibn Abi Talib in, in the Shia tradition, but also in the Sunni and the, and the Sufi tradition. So, so, so we have to kind of start off really with, with Ali and the birth of Ali. So in the Shia tradition, um, Ali is kind of honored um, and, and he, he holds a place that no other companion really holds. Um, and it's his, his, his place is inextricably linked to the place of the prophet too. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Shia tradition, first of all, recognizes that Ali was born in the Kaaba. So in the Kaaba itself, um, there's a whole story that the mother of, of Ali Fatima, she enters in the Kaaba, she gives birth to him. He comes, she comes out. Um, the prophet takes him in his arms. He names him Ali. Um, and, 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 and Ali grows up in the household of the Prophet. Um, you know, his father, Abu Talib, uh, you know, had many children and, um, you know, he, he, he faced some financial difficulties. The Prophet takes Ali into his own home and he raises him sort of like a son. And so, sort of the Shi'i story will, will focus on this very, very intimate relationship that the Prophet has or Ali has with the Prophet as he's growing up. So he's like growing up in the house of the Prophet. Yeah, no, no, thank you. And for those listeners who don't, who, who may not know, um, the relationship between Ali, Sayyidina Ali, and the Prophet Muhammad is that they are first cousins, um, the, right? So you mentioned Abu Talib. Abu Talib is the Prophet's uh, paternal uncle, uh, and uh, uh, his son is Ali. So uh, that that so so that would make him the Prophet's first cousin. Um, later on, of course. Sayyidina Ali is, of course, honored by being also the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. So anyway, sorry, just for the sake Great. of our listeners who may not know. Thank you. So, I appreciate Sayyidina that. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the yeah. name of Sayyidina Ali. Uh, and, of course, the Hashimi clan. Um, and we know, not only from a Sunni perspective, but just from reading history, what a very important role the Prophet's uncle plays in his life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, so he grows up in the house of the Prophet, according to Shia tradition, he is the first one to accept Islam. Although he was very young um, at the time, he accepts this message, um, you know, the Prophet as, as being the, the messenger of God, the first to accept Islam. And the one who, you know, continuously stands in the first line of defense of the Prophet and supporting the Prophet. And so, um, you know, even before Ghadir, uh, when we come to the whole uh, notion of the imamate, the belief, the Shi'i belief in the, the sort of the, the place of the imam as the political and the spiritual religious successor to the prophet, this, according to Shi'i tradition, it starts well before Ghadir. So even, you know, in the beginning of the prophetic mission, he gathers his, his family, um, uh, the, the tribe, uh, and, and, and he sort of proclaims uh, and the, the Quran refers to this, you know, al You know, the Prophet is, is sort of commanded to start off with his immediate family members, and so he brings them together. It's a famous event, well known. Brings them together, he feeds them, and then he he basically conveys the message. The Prophet conveys the message, and he says, you know, this is uh, this is the message. Who is going to support me? And no one stands up except Ali. And uh, you know, Imam Ali is a young young man at the at the time, a young boy at the time. Um, and, and so he stands up and, and the Shi'i tradition holds that this happens three times. And the Prophet says, you know, whoever supports me will be my successor and, you know, so, so on and so forth. Um, and so, so that occurs. And then throughout, you have various kind of traditions where the Shia maintain that the Prophet announced implicitly or explicitly sort of his desire for Ali to continue 
you know, as, as his successor after him. There's another hadith that's known as Hadith Harun. Uh, basically, the Prophet is going out to battle. Uh, you know, Imam Ali participates, of course, in all of the battles. But in one of them, he's asked to stay behind and to look over, you know, the community in Mecca. Uh, I'm sorry, in Medina. And uh, he is, you know, uh, the tradition says that he goes and he tells the Prophet, he says, you know, why are you leaving me behind? You know, and so the prophet tells him, he says, um, do you not wish to be uh, to me as Harun was to Musa, as Aaron, Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no prophet after me. Illa annahu la right? And so the Shia take that again as another announcement of, you know, Aaron was the successor of Moses. Here the prophet is, 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 is explicitly uh, uh, stating that, you know, Ali is kind of in that same position. Um, and then you, you know, you have several other traditions all the way leading up to Ghadir, the, the tradition that you, uh, or the event that you, you, uh, mentioned. And this occurs, you know, a few months before the Prophet's death. The Muslims are returning from, uh, from the pilgrimage, uh, in a, an oasis between Mecca and Medina. It's called Ghadir Khum. And, uh, the tradition, and of course, this tradition is reported in Sunni and Shi'i, uh, books. It's not just, uh, in the Shi'i tradition. The Prophet's store of stops. He gives, a, a speech. Um, if you now, don't mind, sorry, sure. if you don't mind, because we've kind of talked, we've, we, we've alluded to it, but we haven't really addressed it, which is um, the sources. So, right. I mean, obviously with regards to the, the Quran, Sunnis, she, uh, uh, and Shia, like we recognize the Quran as the Kalam of Allah, the word of Allah, that is the scripture, um, unadulterated scripture. And that's something that obviously Shias, Shias and Sunnis agree on. Now, with regards to prophetic tradition, i.e. hadith, ahadith, um, the sources are slightly variant within uh, or among Shias and among Sunnis. If you don't mind talking a little bit about that, I think for most listeners, you know, uh, the canonical books of ahadith among Sunnis are, are pretty well known. Uh, you know, there's Bukhari, there's Muslim, there's Sirmidhi, there's Abu Dawood, and Nisa'i, and Ahmad. I mean, those are sort of the six canonical texts, as we say, Ibn Majah, I might have, for, I may, I may, I might have forgotten. Uh, I think less known, certainly to, to Sunnis, it would be the uh, Shi'i sources. Um, what are the canonical ones, and how do the Shi'i sources, or excuse me, Shi'i scholars of, of tradition view the Sunni sources of tradition, i.e. hadith. Okay, uh, I'll talk about this briefly and then we'll come back to this. I know, more, I know. but we have to detail. talk about it because... Yeah, absolutely, right, absolutely. Right, yeah. Ab absolutely. Uh, so, so in the Shi'i tradition, and again, when I say Shi'i tradition here, by the way, let me just, I, I have to make this clear, I think right now, is yeah. that right now the three major uh, Shi'i groups that are, are still present in, in the contemporary period uh, are the Twelver Shi'is, number one, or they're known as the Ithna Asharis or the Imamis. They make up the bulk of the majority of the Shi'is now. Um, uh, and then there are the Ismailis, uh, and the third are the Zaydis. Um, and, you know, these are much smaller groups, but they're still uh, present in the contemporary period. So when I say, you know, the Shi'i tradition, and, I, and in no way do I mean to, you know, underestimate, uh, you know, the Zaydi and the Ismaili traditions, um, but, you know, most, I, I mean, we're not going to be able to, to talk about all three of those traditions. So my focus is really on the 12 Shi'i tradition. And so um, the, the, um, the main sources of hadith that would sort of be uh, considered the canon, if you will, um, uh, they are four books, Al-Qutub al arba they are referred to. And these were composed um, uh, mainly in the fourth uh, Islamic century put together. They were compiled in the fourth Islamic century. Uh, 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 there are uh, Al Kafi, uh, uh, and then you have Man La Yahdarahu Al Faqih, and then you have Al Tahdib and Al Istibsar. Those are the four kind of uh, 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 major works of of Hadith. And then later on, uh, several centuries later, you would have other works, but those are kind of the main sources of Hadith. Now, the way that uh, Shi'i scholars have uh, looked at and assessed the Sunni sources of Hadith is that they have not rejected them entirely. They have accepted what, according to their standards, their own standards, is acceptable in terms of the Senate, in terms of, you know, the, the chain of narrators, the individuals within those chains, uh, and then the, the text itself. In the Shi'i tradition, it should be said, 
those four sources that I talked about, they're not considered to be absolutely sahih. So we don't have sahih al-kafi, right? It's kitab al-kafi. These, you know, and, and scholars have recognized that there, these sources have uh, some ahadith that are authentic, some that um, are not, or some that are stronger sort of in their, in their, in their chain of narrators. Uh, in their senate, and then also in their mitten, and, and so on. And and you know that that the whole uh, um, science, if you will, of hadith criticism is applicable in the Shi'i tradition as it is in the in the Sunni tradition. Um, and so, absolutely. And so, um, you know, you come to Ghadir, and by the way, the event of Ghadir is really interesting because you have um, in the 20th century there was a a, a 12 Shi'i scholar by the name of Al Alam Al Amini. He dies, I think, in 1971. He uh, wrote a 14-volume book called Kitab al-Ghadir, uh, Fil Kitab wa Sunna wal Adab. It's it's a huge book in Arabic, um, and it looks at all of the uh, traditions of al-Ghadir from the Sunni and the Shi'i sources, and it does a very detailed analysis. And basically, he comes uh, comes up with a conclusion. He looks at 110 sort of companions who related that hadith, um, different companions, and then he assesses it. And it's, again, it's a, you know, 14 volume. I think the newest edition might be 20 volumes or something like that. And it's out there. And so when we talk about Ghadir, I mean, it's no joke. You know, it's an event that you have people who have written multi-volume, uh, uh, you know, books about. And so, so the, the, the way that the Shia view it is that... I've even heard it said, and this may be hyper, hyperbole, but I've even heard it said that perhaps no other incident during the time of the Prophet is as widely reported. Now, again, that may be hyperbole, but uh, I mean, I know that even, uh, even uh, among the sources, there are numerous what we would call riwayat or traditions uh, with slight variances. Uh, again, I've read you know, over 250 or over 200. So again, you know, um, certainly, yeah, echoing what you're saying, Imam Hadi, widely re reported uh, among both the Sunni and Shi'i sources. Uh, and as I said, even among those sources with the slight variances. Uh, but anyway, please, sorry yeah, to continue. So, 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 um, so the, the, the Shi'a, um, you know, they, they maintain that as the, the Muslims were returning from this pilgrimage with the Prophet, and, you know, the various reports, they differ as to the number of Muslims that actually went on that pilgrimage in the tens of thousands, probably. And, and so, um, uh, as they were coming back, um, the prophet received the revelation. Uh, and, and the revelation is in, the, uh, you know, the, one of the verses of the Quran. Ya ayyuhar rasul, ballagh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik, O prophet, uh, convey that which, uh, has been revealed to you by your Lord. وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلْ And if you do not, فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَةَ It's as though you will not have conveyed his message, the entire message. And then the verse says, وَاللَّهُ يَعْصِمُكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ And God will protect you from the people, right? And so the, the Shia maintain that when that revelation came, the Prophet stopped the people, the Muslims. Um, and he, those who, who were, had gone forth, he called them back. And this was in, in you know, the, this oasis called Ghadir Khum, which is between Mecca and Medina. Um, and, and he stopped them and he waited for the rest to arrive. And basically, um, you know, the, the part of the tradition that's important for our purposes, he gave a long sort of khutbah, uh, a long uh, speech. Um, and uh, part of it is, you know, he called uh, upon Ali to stand by his side and he sort of raises his hand uh, to the sky and he says, uh, من كنت مولا فهذا علي مولا Whosoever mola I am, Ali is his mola. And so... This sort of tradition is reported and it's considered to be in the Shi'i tradition as this final, very explicit kind of appointment of Ali as the successor of the Prophet. And then the Shi'i tradition maintains that um, as soon as the Prophet did that, God revealed another verse, which is, according to many reports, the final verse that was revealed. Today is the day in which I have perfected, completed your religion, God says and completed my favor upon you. So the Shia maintain that, you know, this was the final and most explicit sort of appointment of Ali. Now, again, you know, as you said, Pervis, um, you know, this is not something that's only reported in the Shi'i tradition. It's reported in the Sunni tradition. And even those words, Man kuntu mawla, Ali mawla, they reported the whole debate between the Sunnis and Shi'is would be how they viewed that event. 
the significance of that event and it's in particular the term mola you know, when, and which when is the, why I love that you left that un, you left it ambiguous and untranslated. So, mashallah, that's like the wisdom of a teacher. So, thank you for doing that. Um, I want to just sort of echo what you just said, though, if you don't mind. Uh, again, just to sort of you know, for the sake of our Sunni listeners out there, uh, absolutely correct in terms of uh, the you know uh, how Imam Hadi laid it out, which is that um, uh, not only that this event took place, uh, that the Prophet peace be upon him, gave this sermon. And in this sermon, he focused on two things, interestingly enough. He, he reinforced that we hold, we hold fast to the book of Allah, right? Uh, and that we hold uh, and that we protect the ties of Ahl bayt And that is something, again, that is found abundantly in the Sunni sources, that the Prophet reinforced two things, one being the book of Allah, the holding on to the book of Allah, and secondly, as the rope of Allah, right, as the Quran says elsewhere. Um, and then secondly, the importance of and the sanctity of and the fidelity to uh, Ahl al-Bayt, the Prophet's household. Um, and again, the uh, commentators say that one of the reasons for that uh, in terms of prophecy would be that a lot of the audience there were people from Medina and people from Sham um, and from, uh, from the, what is now present-day Syria, which... Again, as as prophetic as it was, that these would be the people that would be that would perpetrate the greatest crime against the against the household of the prophet, which is the martyrdom of Hussein. But I don't want to again get ahead of myself. But yeah, and then also that particular phrase that the pro, that that Imam Hadi mentioned is something that is also found um, in many many riwayat that uh, speak to uh, the events of uh, Ghadir Khom. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Harvis. Um, so, so you know, so here uh, Ali is kind of uh, Imam Ali is appointed explicitly according to the Shi'i view as uh, the Prophet's immediate successor, right? Um, and so the Muslims return. Um, the tradition holds that um, the Prophet, after a few months, he passes away. Um, now there are a lot of other details, but I don't want to get into all of these details for the sake of time. The second event that we want to come to, so the first major event is, is Ghadir. The second major event that we want to come to is occurs with the death of the Prophet and immediately after uh, the death of the Prophet. And this is, uh, you know, what is known as the event of Saqifah. Um, uh, you know, the Prophet dies. I mean, this is a huge tragedy for the Muslim community. Um, and Shia tradition holds that as Bani Hashim, the family of the Prophet, remember Imam Ali is his cousin. Um, and by this time, you know, he had married his daughter. He was his son-in-law. They had children, uh, Hassan, Hussein, and others. And so he was kind of the closest male relative to the Prophet at the time. And so he is kind of busy with preparing the Prophet's body for, for uh, burial. Um, and at this point, there is an event that is held. Um, in a place called Saqifat Bani Sa'ida, where the Ansar and the Muhajireen, some of them, they come together and they're trying to figure out what to do after the Prophet, who's going to lead the community. Um, and, uh, and, and Shia tradition holds this event to essentially be a coup. Um, a, a sort of if a betrayal. Mind, I, yeah, I, go ahead. I want to pro, because I, I think that's a very important point here, because uh, not, I, mean, I mean, not about the coup per se, but the idea here that I want our listeners to focus on and think about is, first of all, the prophet throughout his career reinforced the idea of leadership, that even if two people are traveling, you choose one person as an emir, you choose one person as a leader. Um, you know, and there's so many, there's innumerable statements found in the tradition with regards to the importance of leadership. How then... Can we as Muslims contemplate a scenario where so much emphasis is given on leadership? Um, and meanwhile, historically, uh, you know, the Muslim state has now amassed a great deal of territory, a great deal of resources, a, a great deal of even wealth. How can Muslims, again, as I say, at large, how can we contemplate a scenario where the prophet does not explicitly leave behind a successor. 
right? How do you fill that vacuum? Like, how do you fill that void? And so to contemplate, I think for as, as Muslims at large, for us to contemplate a scenario where the prophet isn't or does not explicitly leave a successor seems entirely implausible to me and seems entirely implausible to, I think, anyone who reads history from a fair perspective. So then the question becomes, and again, this is something I pose my Sunni listeners, is if we then examine the Sunni tradition with regards to how successorship, successorship is assigned or identified, even the most liberal or open-minded reading of Muslim uh, sources, Sunni sources, leave it at best an implicit recognition or an implicit identification of successorship. One is hard pressed to find an explicit text that says, okay, so-and-so is going to be my successor. And again, I would argue that how can we contemplate a scenario where there is not an explicit uh, identifying uh, or identif uh, identification of who is to succeed, succeed, uh, succeed after the death of the prophet? Final point. There are, again, in numerous ahadith where the prophet recognizes the fact that his time is coming to an end. His time on this uh, earthly abode is coming to an end. Whether it's the revelation of Ida Ajah and Rasulullah wal Fat, which, again, uh, you know, according to a lot of the uh, scholars of, of, of the Quran, consider as being foreboding of the prophet's demise. Uh, as you mentioned, Imam Hadi, you know, al lakmatu lakum dinakum, you know, uh, one of the final verses, uh, if not the final verse that was revealed, sort of says, okay, we've completed our favor, uh, religion is done, we've revealed what we needed to reveal, you know, we've perfected your th this religion for you. So anyway, sorry, I wanted to kind of have our listeners pause and kind of identify that as a real issue that, right, that, that history has to deal with, which is, how can the prophet not leave an explicit identification of who was going to succeed? That's great. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate that you made that point. And just to sort of piggyback on that a little bit, I mean, you will even see later on um, that there uh, are various attempts by Muslim scholars later on to try to figure out, you know, what was going on. And so you even have attempts uh, by some to say that, no, the prophet did, he realized this was an issue. It wasn't just left for the community without any, he actually realized, and he, in fact, even appointed Abu Bakr as his successor explicitly. He pointed to him, he said, you know, he should pray instead of, so you do have, I mean, I, I think that the point that you're trying to make is a really important point. You know, sometimes um, there's discussions about, oh, well, the prophet just kind of left things. There was no kind of discussion at all. That's a highly problematic uh, uh, sort of uh, um, argument, I think, to me. Impossible, uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so, so okay, coming back to sort of to the Please, Shia tradition, sorry. Shia tradition uh, recognizes, you know, this event, uh, Bani, uh, uh, um, uh, Bani Saqifah, Saqifah, Bani uh, Sa'idah occurs, and um, essentially it, it considers this to be like a coup, uh, a betrayal of the Prophet's explicit designation of Ali as as his uh, immediate successor. Um, and, and Shia tradition would look at this as the beginning of a series of, of injustices uh, and oppression against the prophetic household. Um, uh, and so, for instance, we have within the historical sources that, um, you know, that, that Ali was uh, after, you know, the Muslims had kind of agreed uh, and given bay'ah to, to Abu Bakr, uh, you know, Omar is kind of seen as, as, as in the Shi'i tradition as, as the mastermind behind this, that he actually kind of helped Abu Bakr and he put him in place and he was the first one to say, we are pledging allegiance to Abu Bakr. Um, uh, and then, um, you know, there's kind of this, this um, uh, sort of, uh, 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 they face the, the prophetic household by, actually going to the house of Ali and Fatima uh, and, and, and trying to force Ali to, play, uh, uh, to pay allegiance, um, and Ali refuses. Um, and, and some of the historical reports say that, you know, there's kind of a threat that's made against the house of Ali and Fatima that we will burn, you know, burn down the place. Uh, and some reports, I believe, that, you know, this is in Tabari as well, uh, that sort of Omar attacked 
the house of Fatima. Um, uh, uh, and, and so tra- Shi'i tradition would see this as just being such a shock that, you know, the prophet's daughter and his son-in-law and, you know, they would, they would be treated in this manner and that this was a series, this was the beginning of a series of injustices that would continue. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you have all of these events and, and Fatima traditions are, are, they, they differ as to when she died. Um, some say this was within a month after the prophet. Some say up to three months after the prophet, um, that she died at a very young, uh, young age. And, and, you know, a lot of scholars have said, you know, she was young. Like, why would she die just out of nowhere? I mean, so, and so they point that to sort of this evidence that her home was attacked. And as a result, directly or indirectly, she was injured and she was in pain. And, and this eventually led to her death. And so you have kind of this, this, this issue. You brought up, Parvis, uh, the issue of Fedak. Um, this is part of it. Um, Fedak, just very briefly, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, Shia tradition holds that after the Prophet, uh, uh, he, he basically took over this land uh, that belonged to the Jews in one of the battles against the Jews. Uh, he took Khaybar. over this land in Khaybar. Uh, uh, he, he, he took possession of Fedak. Uh, which was a large piece of land, um, and he gifted it. Shia tradition holds that he actually gifted it to Fatima. So it actually belonged to her. And uh, there's this whole uh, controversy about how the early caliphate actually uh, took it away from Fatima. Um, and, and, and a whole controversy uh, uh, is there. Um, and that Fatima actually, she went out in public, she went to the Prophet's mosque and she gave sort of this very strong sermon where she defended sort of her grandfather, uh, I'm sorry, her father, the Prophet, her relationship with her father. She defended, you know, her husband, Imam Ali, as sort of the rightful successor to the Prophet. And also she brought up this whole issue of Fadak and the injustices that, uh, um, that, uh, you know, were, per- were perceived against her and, and, and her family. And so, um, um, you know, uh, skipping on a little bit, you know, you have during the time of Abu Bakr, uh, Omar, and Uthman, the first, second, and third caliphs, um, you know, Shi'i tradition holds that uh, Imam Ali kind of did not participate in public life. He, um, he uh, withdrew to his private life, to, you know, his study, to his compilation of, you know, the Qur'an, um, which Shia tradition holds, he started actually during the time of the Prophet. So Ali is considered one of the first compilers of the Quran that began during the time of the Prophet. Um, and so, um, you know, it's until the murder of Uthman um, and the community comes and they, they approach Ali and they want him to become the community in Medina. They approach him and they want him to be the Caliph. And Shia tradition holds that Ali was reluctant um, to accept the Caliphate, but you know, he, he ended up accepting it. And then in this four years and nine months or 10 months of uh, when, uh, you know, Imam Ali is the caliph, you have a series of battles. This is the third event that kind of, you know, these three battles, three in one, um, but they're really, really important. Um, and so, you know, you have the series of battles. Shia tradition would not see these as civil wars. It would view it as rebellions three rebellions because Ali was the rightful caliph of the Muslims and you had um, these companions who rose up three different times uh, in rebellion uh, and resistance to Ali, the first of which is uh, what is known as the Battle of the Camel, Jamal, uh, which was between you know Ali and his forces on the one hand and on the other hand you had the widow of the Prophet, Aisha, uh, and two companions, Talha and Zubair. Um, and, 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 and so you have this battle that takes place, uh, close to Basra. Uh, Ali, when he became the caliph, he, he moved the capital of the Muslims from Medina to Kufa, uh, which is present day Najaf, um, in, in Iraq, uh, just next to Najaf. Um, and he would actually be assassinated and, and buried there. Uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about ritual. Um, and so you have this, this battle and, and, you know, and much of these things are sort of glossed over very quickly when we talk about Islamic history. I mean, yeah. this is a battle uh, where, uh, depending on whose sources you're reading, thousands of Muslims lost their lives. They were killing each other. 
Um, this was not sort of, quote unquote, an external enemy that was attacking the Muslims. This was Muslims killing each other. And so you have this, you know, you have the battle of, of, of Camel, uh, Jamal, um, Shia tradition holds accountable, um, you know, Aisha, the, the wife, the widow of the Prophet, Talha and Zubair and others for instigating this. Um, this is one. Then after that, you have, you know, the battle of Safin, Muawiyah, um, who was an Umayyad. Um, uh, uh, he had been in power in Syria, um, you know, s since the time of uh, the second Caliph Omar. And then, um, you know, uh, uh, during the time of Uthman, who was also an Umayyad. Um, and so he refuses uh, to uh, pledge allegiance to, to Ali uh, and to accept him. Of course, there's the murder of Uthman, uh, uh, which, you know, uh, 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 the Sunni tradition would kind of look at that and, and see that as, as being uh, a justification for, uh, first of all, Aisha and Talha and Zubair and then Muawiyah to wage war against Ali. Ali was seen from, um, you know, uh, from that perspective as not holding to account the murderers of, of Osman. Um, right. uh, but sh sort of Shi'i tradition would deny this. They would, they would suggest that this was just an excuse. And they would point to sort of uh, even Aisha kind of holding Osman accountable and, and being critical of Osman before his death and, and so on and so forth. And yeah. so, you know, so you have this second uh, battle um, uh, and, uh, you know, that ends up in arbitration and it's sort of a long story. Uh, it ends up, uh, in, in the, the, this other group that you brought up, Pervis, the, the, the Kharijai, kind of the yeah. Kharij coming out yeah. against both Muawiyah and Ali. And then you have the third, uh, battle is with the Kharij themselves of Nahrawan. And so Shi'i tradition would look at these and, and consider these to be rebellions. Like these are companions who rose up and they rebelled against the rightful caliph of their time. Um, and I so they would not excuse or justify these yeah. uh, at, at all. Yeah, go ahead. No, I just want to interject with two points. One is a point that you actually made at the outset, which is, and I want to just reinforce here, which is that, yes, Muslims, and again, Muslims at large, have a tendency to read, although perhaps more common among Sunnis for obvious reasons, which is that... Um, because of the fact that there's sort of vindication through history, but <laughs> I'll save that for, for 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 something we'll get to a little later, uh, because I have a question around that for you. But this idea that we we the, the tendency among Muslims, and again perhaps again more more commonplace among Sunnis, to um, uh, romanticize history, like you had you know everything was hunky dory, the Prophet dies. There's just no real civil strife going on. Everybody accepts the uh, the 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 the, uh, the uh, you know the, the authority of Abu Bakr and then Omar and then Uthman and then so on and so forth, right? You just have this complete romanticized version. In fact, to the point where where you have companions on both sides of a battlefield, you literally have a ten a a a, a, a uh, what's the word a, a, a an impulse to try and come up with a way in which these two sides of these opposing sides on a battlefield are literally writing letters of love and devotion to each other while they're up at arms with one another. I mean, that again, defies, uh, you know, defies logic and defies what we would see as being a very real and human experience, which is, you know, this is a, uh, this is a civil strife. And I also appreciate, and, and I say that following right after I just referred to it as a civil strife, which is that, that history is defined by the majoritarian sort of like whoever is able to kind of write or, 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 or to promulgate uh, their version of history. And here again, you see that where largely these battles, these skirmishes, if you will, right, if you want to get into a really kind of politically correct reading of history, oh, it's a skirmish. <laughs> these skirmishes are seen as, yeah, like you said, a civil strife or a civil war. No, in fact, if you read it another way, if you look at history in another way, these are rebellions. These are rebellions against a regime that is uh, unjust, right? right? I'll just say it, right? I'll, I'll call it, again, if we look at history this way. 
which is like, and I have a Star Wars analogy that comes to mind, but I want to, I don't want to offend anybody. So I'll just leave the Star Wars analogy, um, which is like, you've got a rebellion, right? And so it's like, it's like, who's writing the history about the rebellion? Yeah, you have, you could call it a civil war or you call it what it is, which is a group of rebels against a, you know, totalitarian state. So here again, you know, again, I just want to call attention to the fact that it really matters in terms of who is writing the history, from whose perspective is the history told. Um, and I think both you, Imam Hadi, as well as something David mentioned on the last show, which is, again, you know, we have to recognize this sort of Sunni hegemony with regards to the way history has been told. Thank and you. This is Omar. So I'm just going to chime in real quick. Yeah. So it's funny that you, it's interesting that you say that because coming in from, you know, somebody who doesn't have uh, the deep, the deep um, uh, academic insight into what you, what you folks are. This has really been really interesting to me. Right. Um, so I'm just kind of listening with humility and, and trying to learn as much as I can, but just echoing, um, you know, I took a class with a, a scholar uh, at SBIA way back in the day, um, 2002, there was a class uh, about Islamic history. And it was exactly the approach that Pervez you were describing, which is like, Hey, you know, these things happen. It's human nature. And, and this, is a, this was a pretty uh, prominent, um, uh, scholar of, of, of uh, Sunni Islam, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Yaqubi, taught a class in uh, SBIA like in 2002, like a three, four month class, I think it was every week. But it was ex it was exactly that. So uh, that's the perspective I, as a kind of a, a Sunni layman I'm, I'm, I'm listening with. But this has been this has been great. So I'm just going to keep keep listening. So you yeah, go ahead and uh, uh, take it from there. No, I like I, I appreciate you chiming in, Omar. Um, sorry, uh, Imam Hadi. I hope I didn't derail kind of what where you were going. Uh, I, I think, you know, again, just for the sake of time. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that how you kind of characterize it at the, again, uh, when, when we were talking about the, you know, the, the death of the prophet, which is, you know, again, she reading of history is that the, uh, the, uh, the caliphate of Abu Bakr, and then a lot of the events that transpire, uh, thereafter, uh, and for decades are read as betrayals. Uh, as betrayals of uh, the, uh, as betrayals towards the household of the prophet, and specifically, uh, you know, a betrayal of the prophet identifying Sayyidina Ali as being his successor. Absolutely, um, and so uh, you know, you have you have these um, series of events. Um, finally, you know, uh, uh, Imam Ali is assassinated, um, and uh, and and. You know, there's this whole. It continues, sort of this, this, the um, you know tension uh, continues uh, with Muawiyah and uh, Imam Ali's son Al Hassan. Um, you know, the the older grandson of the Prophet. Um, you know, there's this uh, a, a peace treaty, if you will, that that's between them. Shia tradition holds Muawiyah to have betrayed that peace treaty. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, with Muawiyah, you have the rise of the Umayyad, obviously. And so, um, you know, after, after Al-Hassan, which Shi'i tradition holds to have been poisoned, um, indirectly by Muawiyah, um, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he passes away, Al-Hassan passes away, and sort of the Shi'i community kind of, uh, or, or, you know, that, that very early community, the, the proto-Shi'i community kind of develops and supports, uh, uh, you know, Al Hussein, uh, 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 Ali's second son, uh, and and the and the and the grandson, the second grandson of um, of the Prophet peace be upon him. So, the, so, so uh, sorry, Annie. This is a, a, a real question because I, I, you know, with regards to the way Shias interpret uh, Imam Hassan and 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 the the so called treaty with with Muawiyah, um, is that seen as kind of him abdicating his uh, his uh, claim to the caliphate, or is not read that way? No, it's not. Um, okay, we have to understand that uh, sort of the Shi'i uh, view is that the imam is both the political and the sort of spiritual leader, and so Shi'i tradition uh, uh, reads that as 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 the imam kind of um, 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 uh, conceding or giving a concession. Uh, so that Muawiyah kind of holds power and there's no more bloodshed and there's no more, you know, civil strife and killing. But Shi'i tradition still holds the imam as being the rightful imam 
Um, uh, so he, it's not that sort of he abdicated his rightful position as the imam. It's uh, because he wanted to kind of save the the community from further civil strife. So he made a deal uh, with Muawiyah. And part of the deal, according to the Shia tradition, is that um, after Muawiyah, power would go back to al-Hassan. Um, and so Shia tradition holds that, you know, Muawiyah betrays this. Um, and he ends up actually assassinating him, uh, you know, killing al-Hassan. And then, you know, of course, he, he installs his own son, Yazid. Uh, uh, and here you have, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of controversy because when you come to, uh, you know, later Sunni writers even and Sunni authors, uh, there's this huge controversy about Yazid. Um, you know, some have kind of tried to justify Muawiyah, not all. Some have tried to justify Muawiyah. But when it comes to Yazid, you have this huge problem because Yazid was just openly, so openly, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it um, in, in, a, in a positive way, just in his morals, in his, in his attitude, he was so anti-Islamic, right? Um, and yeah. so... Um, and I would submit that it is a real minority uh, of, of, of Sunnis that would have anything really laudable to say about Yazid. Uh, unfortunately, I feel like uh, there is some of that that happens, and I think a lot of it is polemical. A lot of it is just sort of like, oh, you know, it's like we're going to own the Shias, right? We're going to get back at the Shias and say, no, 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 not only was Yazid, you know, rightful or whatever, you know, he was this meritorious figure in history. Um, and I think that's a minority. I, I would I would submit that that's sort of a minority approach. Uh, the vast majority of sort of Sunnis even recognizing that Yazid was of, uh, uh, you know, had his character was highly deficient and certainly his political leadership was deficient. So I, I'm going to just put that out there. But um, anyway, sorry. Imam thank Hattie. you. Uh, thank you. Probably. So, um, yeah. So then you have with Yazid, you have this really big uh, sort of watershed moment. Um, you know, he... Um, he tries to uh, gain recognition, and, and by now you have to kind of understand, uh, you know, Hussein is um, uh, close to sixty years old. He he, uh, so he's he's close to sixty years old. He, um, you know, he's the head of the sort of prophetic household. He's recognized as as being the senior of Bani Hashem. Uh, and so uh, Yazid tries to get his allegiance and his approval. Hussein refuses. Um, you know, he, he says, you know, I'm not going to pay allegiance to you. Uh, and so um, uh, to make a long story short, uh, you know, he has to flee. Hussein has to flee Medina, the city of his grandfather, the city of his birth. Uh, he goes to Mecca uh, and, and slowly he begins to receive support. Um, sort of pledges of support to stand up against uh, Yazid, um, that does not materialize. And he ends up in uh, having to leave Mecca. Uh, and, and as he leaves Mecca, he heads towards Kufa. Uh, that material support does not, uh, that support does not materialize. Uh, Yazid dispatches an army, a large army, uh, to intercept and sort of take him in uh, towards uh, uh, Karbala, which is a north, a desert plain north of Kufa, uh, and uh, and tradition holds that um, they arrive in the beginning of the month of Muharram. Uh, Hussein is with his family members, women, children, uh, some companions, about a hundred people altogether. Uh, he has about seventy-two companions, uh, and 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 they're surrounded by uh, an increasing Umayyad army. Some reports say that the army reaches about 30,000 uh, Umayyad troops and they surround, uh, you know, the Prophet's grandson and his family in this desert plain. Um, and they are denied, according to the Shi'i sort of under, uh, a version of, of, of history and uh, tradition, uh, is for three days, the entire um, camp of Imam Hussein is denied access to water. Uh, and then on the 10th day, which is the day of Ashura, um, the Umayyad army launches an attack and they kill everyone um, except um, some of the women uh, and some of the young children. All of the men are, are, are butchered, um, uh, you know, in a very sort of horrific way, um, you know, uh, including Hussein's six-month-old child. I mean, he's killed in his father's arms. Uh, it's a very, very tragic uh, event. 
um, uh, the women and children are then taken captive uh, by the Umayyad army. Uh, they're taken to Kufa first, uh, to the court of the governor, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, and then from there all the way to Damascus, to the court of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Uh, and it's a very sort of shameful um, way that they were taken prisoner. Uh, and then they end up, you know, coming back um, back to the city of Medina after a while. This would just be a moment in Islamic history that would uh, define, I think, the Muslims, but in particular, really, uh, the Shi'i tradition. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, I mean, if you, if you really read the, the sources, and by the way, you know, there are, uh, again, sor- it's not just the Shi'i sources that recount yeah. this, the Sunni sources. In fact, some of, uh, there are Sunni scholars who wrote the entire sort of epic of the day of Ashura, all of the events that transpired leading up to the day of Ashura and on the day of Ashura with all of sort of the gruesome details of what Correct. happened. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and so, um, you know, that would be a major, major moment, um, you know, in the history of, uh, of Shiism. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to say like the, yeah. like the, the body of uh, Hussein, like Imam Hussein was, was desecrated. I mean, this is something that the Sunni sources recognize. Uh, there's in fact, you know, uh, Books written about where precisely is the body of uh, of Imam Hussein placed? Because there's sort of, you know, there's a, there's a disagreement whether his head lies in one place and his body in another. And, and I mean, you can actually this this is something that is discussed in the Sunni sources. I mean, this isn't just something that is, you know, this isn't just sort of a passion play that plays out in the Shi'i sources. This is very much real history. Um, you know, that, that, that we, that we, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a blight on our, on our tradition to say the least. Yeah. And, 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 and see, the thing is, um, I think the important point to, to, to note, and this is sort of relevant to our contemporary period is that, you know, the Shia would see this as just this, probably the, the biggest tragedy in the history of, of, of Islam. Um, you know, that, that this is the beloved grandson of the prophet. Um, you know, this is the, the son of the prophet who he considered his son, his own son. You know, you have traditions of Hussein as a child riding on the back of the prophet, the prophet pro- uh, prolonging his prostration in the, the congregational prayer because Hussein is on his back. Um, mm-hmm. you know, there's a tradition where the prophet is standing on the pulpit He's speaking to the Muslims, uh, and Hussein runs in, and he's kind of wearing a long clothing, and he trips, he falls, and the, the Prophet comes running down. He stops his sermon. He comes running down from the pulpit, and he carries Hussein. And, you know, when the companions ask him, you know, what happened? He says, when I saw Hussein fall, I felt like my heart dropped. And so, you know, and then there's this very famous tradition that the Prophet says, Hussein on minni wa anam in Hussein. Hussein is from me. I am from Hussein. And so... You know, this, like, it's really difficult to wrap our heads around how it was possible for those who, again, these are not sort of outsiders. These are people who were claiming to be Muslims, to be followers of the Prophet, how they could just stand there and and be so merciless towards him and to to his family and and to to massacre them in such a brutal uh, way. And so, um, you know, what I think uh, is relevant for our contemporary period is sort of the Shi'i idea that, you know, yeah, this is, uh, uh, you know, some historical sources, some Sunni sources, they talk about Muharram, they talk about what happened on Ashura, but it's not commemorated. It's not remembered. You know, I mean, you have organizations uh, that come out with statements in the beginning of the year saying this is the new year, the new Islamic year, happy new year. You know, this is the, the first uh, 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 month, Muharram, and they may mention Ashura, and then they mention this, this, this report, which is found in, in the Sunni tradition, about Ashura being an important day because, you know, God created Adam on that day, God saved Moses on that day, God, all of these events, um, you know, that are mentioned, and there's like no mention of, uh, 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 of Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, being massacred on this day, or if there is, it's just, you know, glossed over really quickly. And this happens. So, and so, yeah, so that, you know, yeah, go ahead. Perfect. Question. Uh, do, do, do the Shi'i sources recognize, um, 
you know, the Ashura uh, the, or Yom Ashura as it relates to Musa, Ali no, 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 oh, actually okay. they don't. I um, did not know that. So, yeah, the Shia tradition actually holds that those reports were complete fabrications during the time of the Umayyads in order to make ah. the Muslims forget about what happened to Hussein. And by the way, this is not just um, an argument that the Shia make. Uh, the Shia make um, Ibn al-Jawzi, uh, 6th Islamic century, <laughs> famous Sunni scholar, has his uh, famous book called Kitab al which is a book of fabricated reports. And he has in that, you know, he talks about, he has a chapter on the virtue of the day of Ashura. And he mentions all of these traditions. And he says, look, there are some people who claim to be Sunnis. They wanted to really hurt the Shia, the Ratiba, according to him. And so they, um, they made up all of these traditions about, you know, the virtues of Ashura. And, and, and he, he, he explicitly says, he says, these are all fabrications, they're lies, this doesn't happen. Yes, he, he sort of says that the Prophet did say that the day of Ashura is important and Muslims should fast. But again, uh, the Shi'i tradition would reject all of this. This is all in the Shi'i tradition, sort of a fabrication in order to turn attention away from the horrific uh, events of, of the day of Ashura, um, uh, you know, and the, and the murder of, of the Prophet's grandson. Um, and so this is, again, a point of contention. And we, uh, unfortunately, this is something that we see repeatedly happen every single year, a point of contention between Sunnis and Shi'is when it comes to commemorating. And the way that I usually try to tell people to, to think of this is, look, again, you know, this is a matter of whose history are you reading? You know, what are the sources uh, uh, and, 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 and which stories in history, which version of history are you, are you reading? It's kind of like, you know, the whole issue of Thanksgiving. Right. This is the example that I usually tell people. I mean, you know, when we celebrate Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is just this very joyful occasion. Uh, it's a time we celebrate the settlers, you know, coming together with the natives and just everyone loving each other and having turkey and, you know, and, 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 but, but there are a group of people who every single year on the day of Thanksgiving, that is a day of mourning for them. It's not a day of Thanksgiving. It's a day, it's recognized as a day of mourning. And so, I mean, this analogy, I think, fits perfectly well with, with Ashura and the way that, you know, it's, it's seen and it's viewed um, by these, uh, uh, you know, two, two sort of communities. Um, and just listening, yeah. and just listening kind of as, you know, like I said, kind of the, the layman's uh, viewpoint, like, absolutely. If I'm, if I'm listening to this, I think, yeah, um, it, it's, a, it's an event that absolutely is, is kind of getting swept under the rug. I mean, I had like I do remember like my Sunni grandmother saying she would she would it was something she would commemorate, uh, but again, just kind of off the cuff, right? But um, but I guess I you know so, say again, Pervez, did you want to say something? Well, I was going to interject some it's kind of Hyderabadi related. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was just going to throw in a comment that man. I, I mean, like this is really complicated stuff, yeah. and it's hard enough like teaching a 10, 12, 14 year old. Um, that, you know, despite some of these confusing, um, things in the religion, you know, it's good and it's, it's, it's pure. This just throws kind of a, a monkey wrench in it. I mean, how do you teach like a seven or nine or 11 or 13 year old kid that Muslims were doing this to each other, right? That were even companions right after, you know, again, I'm speaking from your, from the Shia uh, point of view. Um, just as I digest this, how do you teach them? that the religion is still good and pure and, and, a, and a, a source of uh, goodness when the Muslims who came right after the Prophet were, were you know, having these experiences. So it's kind of, it's confusing, right? So I could kind of see not as a, not as a conspiracy theory to cover it up, but in a way to kind of, you know, how some people just don't want to deal with difficult topics, right? That's just kind of how I'm looking at it from, from uh, kind of the average, the average Sunday point of view. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question, uh, Imam Hadi, if you could comment on that. But I mean, I think I, I want to throw my question in there just because I was gonna, I was going to save this for later. But I think it really very nicely dovetails with what Umar just talked about or asked, which is, you know, for Sunnis, right, it becomes this, like I said, history, the way it plays out, whether it's the early caliphate, whether it's the Umayyad, Abbasid period, outside of a few, like I said, uh you know, blights on the tradi- on on uh, within history. Certainly, Karbala being one of them. By and large, history is sort of this vindication of Islamic supremacy 
and God's pleasure. And you have this huge expansion that takes place material. Uh, the material empire is spreading. Um, and so, like I said, I mean, history, it, there's, there's a very easy tendency among Sunnis to interpret historical events as, like I said, God's vindication. Like you are the chosen people, you are blessed and so on. Well, we have an entire segment of our community that views history very, very differently. Um, and so if you could kind of comment on that, like, is there a way in which history is interpreted then vis-a-vis uh, -vis theology, right? Like yeah. if it's not God's vindication, then what is it? Sure. Um, and then, you know, and then, and then also kind of, you know, to address Omar's point, which is, you know, how do you teach this to like, how do you have a conversation around this, you know, with, with, with young, very susceptible uh, people? Or yeah, even and that take, and that can lead right into our, our kind of our second second part of the discussion, which is the the theological. Correct, correct. I wanted to. Yeah, great. Uh, you know, those are excellent questions. Uh, uh, look again. You know, when it even comes to the theological views of Muslims, there's a great diversity. You know, Muslims debated theological points. You know, uh, for centuries, and and we had so many different schools of thought, um, so many different theological groups and sensibilities. Uh, about every single sort of topic um, imaginable. And so uh, you do have uh, within the history those that try to understand this and you have, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, trying to understand the presence of evil, for instance, in the world, the problem of evil, the problem of human suffering, the problem of people doing bad things, right? And so these were theological, very robust sort of theological conversations that uh, that were... were um, uh, uh, continued in uh, sort of in the history of Islam, and you had within the Sunni and the Shi'i sort of schools uh, various approaches to kind of uh, uh, understand all of this. Um, uh, what I would say is, uh, look, we we I think the problem arises when we try to romanticize uh, and we try to assume that everything is perfect, just as you said, Purviz. I think you said it very well. That, you know, when there's this attempt to constantly try to vindicate, um, because look, in the end, look, we're human beings. Yes. You know, observant Muslims, we believe that God exists. We believe that God is just. We believe that God is almighty, that God is benevolent. All of these things that God is in control. There's Qaba, there's Qaba, all of these things, right? But in the end, um, we're responsible. Human beings are responsible. Uh, uh, and so, you know, so our actions, what we decide to do and not do, uh, uh, you know, those kind of interplay with God as being also uh, 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 sort of the God of, of creation, the God of history, and so on and so forth. And so it's, it, it gets really, really complex, but we cannot sort of assume that these were not human beings. I mean, in the end, they were human beings. And with human beings, you have uh, various emotions, you have various sensibilities, you have objectives, you have power, you have piety, you have these, and power and piety collide, um, you know, look, if you if you look at the example of, of Ashura, let's come back to the example of Ashura, um, you know, if you look at even the Shi'i tradition, the way that portrays it, um, one of the commanders of the Umayyad army is Omar ibn Sa'd, he's a major commander of uh, the, the, um, the Umayyad army, uh, Shi'i tradition holds that he attributes poetry to him, um, where he was promised by Yazid that he would be given governorship of Array. Uh, Array was very important in the Persian sort of, uh, uh, in Persia, uh, present day Tehran, right? And so he would, Omar ibn Sa'd was promised by Yazid that he would have governorship of Array. Shi'i tradition holds him kind of, it has this poetry, uh, that attributes to him saying, having him ask himself, kind of face this tension of, on the one hand, I've been promised uh, mulk al governorship, ownership of a ray, and this is my dream to be the governor of, of, of this, this, this district. Um, but on the other hand, this is Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet. And so it shows it very clearly that in the end, this person was making a choice. You know, um, there's this, this, there's this, there's this pride that I'm looking uh, uh, towards and I'm anticipating, but then also this, this tension uh, uh, and this problem that I face. And in the end, you know, he decides to choose that over this one. 
Um, but then it also gives the sort of the, the tradition of, of another uh, a figure by the name of Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, who was also a commander of the Umayyad army. And he also, you know, Shi'i tradition holds that uh, he, he comes and he sort of defects from, from the Umayyad army and he approaches Hussein. And, you know, he tells him, he says, last night when I was asleep, I saw a dream of me standing on the fence between heaven and hellfire. And by Allah, I will never choose hellfire over uh, heaven. And so he defects to that. So, I mean, the point that I, I'm trying to make is that, you know, yes, there are all of these theological points that we can discuss and these theological doctrines, but in the end, we are human beings. And, and we have these choices that we have to make. Um, and, 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 and depending on, you know, the choices that we make, you know, these can have severe repercussions for ourselves, for, for others around us. And so, yes, um, you know, Huda, there is guidance from God. Um, but the Quran says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبْوَنًا Those who, uh, you know, strive in the path of God, God will, um, you know, sort of give them uh, 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 their way, up, you know, and, 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 and they'll arrive at that sort of destination, their final destination. Way is plural, so, right? Subulana. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Way is plural, right? right? I mean, it, well, God will sort of un, uh, uh, unveil and unravel the multiple, the multiplicity of ways of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of striving in his path. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, yeah. I think, and I, and I agree with Omar, I think this is a great way to transition into theology because, I think like you said very and, and you very eloquently kind of summarized that you know, this this is the problem therein lies the problem as as they say which is which is that if we if we if we measure god's pleasure based exclusively on either material or uh, like material a- a- accumulation or material success of empire or power even as you know or a power and authority as being or equating that with God's pleasure, well, therein lies the problem. And maybe that's maybe our viewing and our reading of history is really what needs to be examined. And I would submit to you that a vanquished people, a people that are defeated, certainly psychologically and mentally, have a tendency to look at power and when were we at on top politically speaking or, you know, materially speaking as being equating that with God's vindication or God's pleasure and not seeing that, you know, yeah, you can achieve those things, but you can, you can achieve them by committing huge acts of, 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 of oppression and injustice as well. So, you know, God's pleasure is by doing the right thing, not necessarily the, the, the might thing, right. The thing that gets you power and might. So anyway, I, I would just wanted to say yeah, that. And, yeah. And I think to your point about, about human beings, like for, I mean, for me, it would almost seems easier, like with regards to Sunnis, at least according to their own tradition, which is look for us, infallibility ends with the prophet, right? Where the prophet was infallible and everybody else is, is capable of human error. So, and that includes companions of the prophet that includes, you know, uh, that includes certainly people that came a hundred years after the prophets. So, so, so you know, in terms of this attempt to romanticize history, we don't we don't have to necessarily lionize uh, all the individual players of that history. So, um, and so that kind of brings me to my question, really, Imam, Imam Hadi, which is, if we're talking about the real sort of point of departure, right, between Shiism and and Sunnism. Uh, and if we, you know, and, 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 you know, again, you've kind of walked us through some of the major historical, uh, historical uh, events that kind of shape that, you know, wherein lies the real major point of departure between these two uh, great traditions. Um, if we talk about the issue of sort of, you know, authority, uh, you know, whether it's political authority or it's religious authority, Right. I mean, that to me really serves as the primary kind of point of departure between Sunnism and Shiism is, you know, with regards to and I mentioned this. And if you and, and I know you heard the episode with, with uh, David, but if I could maybe kind of pose the same question, right, the way I did with David and have you address it, which is, you know, to me, again, really in, in painting this in broad strokes is the question of the infallibility of the prophet, something I just alluded to, right? The ma'asum, that the prophet is ma'asum. The prophet is, uh, possesses isma, which is this sort of divine protection of infallibility. 
Um, uh, and and with regards to political, like uh, with regards to politically speaking or religiously speaking, like let's just say that's sort of like a papal authority, right? Papal authority that's given, you know, that 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 perhaps those who are listening who are Catholics can kind of recognize, right? That kind of level of infallibility. Um, for, 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 for Sunnis, the question that emerges, well, what happens to that infallibility? Or I, I should say for Muslims, the question that emerges is, well, what happens to that infallibility of the prophet, peace be upon him, once he dies, once he leaves this temporal world? Does it just sort of evaporate? Does it just sort of disappear? Or does it linger? And the Sunni response to it is, well, it lingers or it is uh, encapsulated in the ijma, in the jama'ah, and the and the community, uh, and hence you have al sunnah wal jama'ah, right? The it, it 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 is infused in this idea of the consensus of the community ijma, and that is very problematic and has its own you know. There's a whole discussion there. For for Shia, for our Shia brethren, then that infallibility is found and is and is and is infused within Ahl al-Bayt. Would you agree with that kind of, like I said, broad stroke assessment? And, and then let's kind of get into kind of the theology of that um, as we move the conversation. Yes, I would say that's a, that's a, that's a great assessment. Um, so of course, you know, all Muslims, Sunni and Shi'i, they believe that the Prophet was Masum, uh, what he was inerrant, he was infallible. Um, the, the Shia, because of their belief in the imama, uh, uh, as sort of, a, it's a, it's a theological, sort of a doctrinal belief that, you know, when the Prophet, uh, designated, uh, Ali as his immediate successor, this was, first of all, this was, uh, 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 you know, sort of a command by God. Remember, we, we go back to the Quran that says, you know, O Prophet, reveal what has been, uh, or convey what has been revealed to you. So this is sort of a divine designation, if you will, of Ali as the successor to the Prophet, and the Prophet himself, you know, sort of um, uh, verifying this and making it explicit. So the point of departure for the Shia is that the station uh, of the Imamate, like the station of prophethood, is a divine designation. It's a divine appointment. Now, there is a difference. The Prophet uh, or the Messenger uh, receives revelation, wahi, from God. And as such, uh, you know, some of the prophets, they, they had a, 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 a mission to go beyond their immediate circle. And they had, you know, like the prophet who was, you know, Nabi and, and, and a Rasul. That's the distinction, the technical distinction, you know, prophet and messenger. Some of them, they were prophets, they received revelation, but they did not have a particular mission. Uh, while others were messengers, they were mandated to convey a message to the public. Um, and so, the uh, the prophet and the messenger they receive revelation. The imam does not receive revelation. Okay. But the function of the imam is to continue to preserve the revelation of the prophet and to explain the revelation of the prophet, uh, both the Quran in this in this case and the prophetic sunnah. So to protect yeah. and to guard and to explain the uh, uh, um, uh, sort of the the prophetic. Uh, revelation and the prophetic teachings. Um, so the difference is really is only in terms of the capacity of the prophet and messenger to receive revelation and re revelation ends with the prophet Muhammad. There is no final revelation after, uh, you know, that is the final revelation. There is no revelation after Muhammad, but the, the, the political and the religious, the spiritual duty of the prophet continues in the person of the imam, as one who is designated by, by God. So this is really important. And so because the isma of the prophet is linked to his capacity as God's messenger, uh, who is to teach the people on behalf of God, because the imam has that same job to teach and to preserve, then that isma also transfers from the prophet also to the imam. The imam is thus also inerrant. He is ma'soom um, because of his function as, you know, the successor of the prophet and his function as the teacher, educator, and sort of the protector of the tradition. And so Shi'i tradition would maintain that the imam would hold asma in the same way that the prophet would hold asma in order to fulfill that function. And, Got it. Uh, uh, and this, you know, the, the, the 12 Shi'i tradition would then 
uh, come to recognize 12 imams uh, okay. as, as the successors of, of the Prophet. Um, you know, the Shi'i tradition would hold that the Prophet actually named all of them, um, even by name. Uh, you know, mm. Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and then through the line, the progeny of Hussein, all the way until the 12th Imam, who the Shia, the Shia would identify as being Al Mahdi. And so these Imams successively, they uh, took on the responsibility of continuing to guide the uh, Muslim community on behalf of the Prophet, um, having held that uh, sort of divine protection, Al Asma, because they were designated by God and by the Prophet. Um, and they would continue to do so successively, one after another. A um, couple, of, couple yeah. of questions, or, or one question and, and then a comment. Um, the question then would be, uh, okay, you, you mentioned the last, the, the 12th Imam uh, as being uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Mahdi, uh, right? And uh, but with regard the first Imam then is Sayyidina Ali, right? Correct. Yes, the first Imam is Ali, and then the second is Hassan, the third is Hussein, and then you go through a line of Imams all the way to the twelfth, who is uh, uh, considered Muhammad ibn al Hassan, and his title is al Mahdi. Um, and so, uh, now, this is the same Mahdi that Sunnis believe. Well, actually, before hold on, I'll, I'll come back to this because I, I do want to make this quick point that I think that would allow you and I both to kind of. Like, like dispense with having to, you know, keep coming back to this idea that, look, what we're defining is according to the Ithna Ashari or the Twelver or the majority sort of Shia perspective. Um, where the, the sort of sectarianism that emerges within Shiism sort of arises is with regards to, uh, I believe, with the fifth imam, I'm sorry, with the, with the seventh, uh, yeah, the progeny of... Um, of uh, Jafar al-Sadiq, who was the sixth imam, whether or not the imamate should have continued with his eldest, Ismail, or whether it should have continued with, uh, uh, Musa. Uh, I'm sorry. Musa, Musa al Thank you, Musa, Musa al -Kadim. And where the disagreement emerges uh, and where you have the Ismaili branch kind of branch off is those who followed the, the uh, elder son of uh, Jafar al-Sadiq, radiallahu anh. Yes, that was that's one group, the Ismailis. Another group Ismaili. that we mentioned uh, are the Zaydis, who are still active in the sort of contemporary period. The Zaydis, but even smaller, even smaller. Yeah, the Zaydis are even smaller. They're mostly in sort of in 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 the Yemen right now, Yemen. Um, right. and so uh, the Zaydis would actually break off earlier. So after, uh, the, if you will, the fivers and the seveners, if you pardon that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. And I had a question. Yeah. yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to actually step back a bit um, and, and ask about, like, why 12? And is it all, the, is it all um, great based on, like, lineage? And what's the root, root source? This marks the end of part one of our discussion with Imam Hadi Khazwini. In the next episode of the Diffuse Congruence, episode 100, we will pick up where we left off. Imam Hadi will touch more on the history and theology of Shiism, and he will also touch on some common, sometimes misunderstood practices of the Shia community in the U.S. and abroad. Thank <laughs> you.